Welcome to the Date Forever podcast. Keep your relationship fueled up with strategies discovered by couples and experts. Because at Fuel Collective, we believe better relationships will equal a better world. You are about to discover specific insights and tools that cost little or nothing to implement to help you date forever. And now, here are your hosts, a couple who always have a half-packed suitcase and a date night in the calendar, Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Welcome to the Date Forever podcast. In this episode, we talk all about the three tips to practicing true self-love, understanding healthy and unhealthy styles of relationships, and becoming your own soulmate. Now let's get into it. Welcome to the Day Forever podcast, everyone. Today we've got Miranda Clare joining us. She's an experienced relationship expert and motivational speaker. Miranda is also known as the soulmate coach because she helps individuals have self-love, singles to meet their soulmates and couples to find their spark. She integrates NLP, timeline therapy, psychotherapy, hypnotherapy and coaching to help clients get real results. She's helped thousands of people from all over the world, and we're really excited to have her here. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm super excited to be here. So just to kick off, how did you become the Soulmate Coach? That's a very good question. I kind of feel like I was born the Soulmate Coach, if I'm honest, because I was a bit of a weird kid. While um, while my friends were in the bedroom getting ready to go clubbing when I was 18, I would be the one on the balcony with their parents actually coaching them on their relationships. So that was my informal start. And um, over the years, I you know have gathered a lot of qualifications, as, as you kindly mentioned in my intro. And um, I guess I'm not going to say I'm a hopeless romantic. I'm going to say I'm a hopeful full romantic and I've always been interested in love, romance, a little bit of a Disney princess at heart but I I guess I've seen a lot of dysfunctional relationships over the years in you know I was being raised by a single mum and and definitely saw that as a fly on the wall growing up and you know went through that path of kind of you know when you become your parents and inherit a few of their patterns yourself and and did a little bit bit of that myself and ultimately that's what led me to personal development to correct my own interesting patterns around the relationship with myself and others and deep down I knew that life was relationships but I wanted to be the best version of me within that and I guess once getting huge breakthroughs in my own life I ultimately decided that I wanted to work within that industry of personal development and the thing that I was most passionate about through my whole life informally in my younger years and more formally later was definitely that common theme of relationships so that's kind of how the soulmate coach was born and I I guess I just nothing gives me more satisfaction in terms of a mission than having someone that had low self-esteem message me and say I've actually mastered self-love due to doing some work with you or having a couple say you saved our marriage or you created our relationship and you know I think it's really important to do what sets your soul on fire and where you you are going to add the most value as a result so that's how I got into it. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I, I totally agree. I think the quality of our relationships drastically impacts the quality of our life. 100%. And the, the quality of the relationship you have with yourself manifests those relationships as well. So it all kind of um, dovetails together beautifully. And it, it's so, so important. Mm. So as the soulmate coach, I'm, I'm really curious, like, how do you define a soulmate? Like, what's your interpretation? It's interesting. I often have people posting on my my social media, uh, you don't just have one soulmate. And I'm like, easy, tiger. I haven't (laughs) even told you my definition. It's a a headline to grab attention for fellow romantics out there. But um, yeah, I, I really believe that we are our own soulmate. And what I mean by that is if you think of the kind of Hollywood blockbuster definition of a soulmate, it's like that person you're going to grow old and take your last breath with. Guess what? You've met them. It's you. (laughs) It's that person that you're going to share all of your highs and lows and every experience, that person to have your back guess what, you've met them, it's you. But I get what we mean by having that that important, significant other who is our person that we hold hands with on this journey of life. And I truly believe that in life, people come into your life for a reason, season or a lifetime. And whenever there's soul connection, within any of those relationships, whether it's a friend, family, partner, business partner or romantic lover, when there's that soul connection, I think they are a soulmate of sort. But I really do think that there'll be that one person where you wake up and you blink and you go, wow, three decades have passed. You were that soulmate in my life. And ultimately, all of the other soulmates came into your life for a reason or a season to get you ready 
for that person, but that doesn't make those connections any less valid. They were just modules in the University of Soulmate Life that had you become the best version of you. Ultimately, some of them were easy lessons, some of them were heartbreaking lessons, and it brought you to that final person who was in true alignment, but possibly all of those other people helped you become in alignment with yourself. Mm. So if someone's at the beginning of that kind of self-love journey and really, I guess, getting to know themselves, uh, what are what are some of the things that people can do to, I guess, fall in love with themselves as that soulmate? Absolutely. So I guess three things come to mind. The first one is a very, very simple one that you can do immediately and you conveniently only need some red lipstick and this includes <laughs> the, boys, the boys that are listening. Don't worry, we're not going to be doing drag. But um, basically you write on a mirror, I am enough or you are enough. Ideally, I am enough. I think it's more personal. And I know it sounds so simple and so almost cheesy. And the first time I did it, I must admit, I borrowed this from a mentor whose work I was studying and I thought, you know, that's too easy. And this was a mentor that did heavy trauma work with people and worked with addicts and people that had the opposite of self-love. And I thought, can't be that easy. And I wrote it on the mirror and I didn't do it intellectually. I did it in a way where I really looked at myself in the eye and took a big deep breath first. And then I wrote it and I just really let those words sink in. And it does something profound to you in your heart. You feel your heart open when you do that. And I think if you follow most issues back to their core, there's really two belief systems that are at the core of everyone's issues, including self-love issues. And those belief systems are I'm not enough or I'm not lovable. Mm -hmm. And that idea of I'm not enough for love or kind of links to I'm unlovable. And if you can just cut through that with a simple sentence that means the opposite of those two deepest negative beliefs that I think most people need to work through to some extent this lifetime, it really does something. So I would suggest that I'm enough practice. Wake up and write it on your mirror every morning. Put it on the little mirror in your car. Car, do it, Put it on your bathroom mirror. You'll get weird looks when you have visitors, but it's all right. <laughs> we're, we're in a bit of lockdown at the moment, so you won't have as many visitors. But um, it's, it's a really beautiful practice. And that's a very simple, easy one. All right. Then number two and three. Number two and three, I know we don't have forever and my normal shortest seminar is two full days, so I will be my full of time. Uh, another one is to have a mindfulness practice every morning because how you start is how you finish and a lot of people kind of go to bed late, eating crappy food, watching you know, Netflix and then they wake up and hit their alarm and then jump into whatever their responsibilities are that day and there's not a lot of time for really intentional self-love mm-hmm. practice. I know I personally wake up at 5 a.m. every morning. You might be asking how I have this much energy late in the day. Coffee's my best friend. That's my <laughs> self-love activity. But I wake up and I... The first thing I do is I do some meditation and I've got a beautiful sound healing that's the frequency, literally the sound frequency of love, self-love. And I listen to that. Then I get my gratitude journal out. I write down 10 things I'm grateful for. But here's the key. Most people write down, if they have a gratitude journal at all, things that they're grateful for in life. And it's like, I'm grateful for the promotion. I'm grateful for food in my fridge. I'm grateful for my partner. And those things are incredible. But guess what? They are all externals. That's not an act of Mm. self-love. That's gratitude for your life. That's not gratitude for you. So what I recommend you do is you jump out of bed, do five minutes of meditation, get a piece of paper out and draw a line down the middle. And on one side, maybe on the right, write down all the things in your life you're most grateful for. That's the easy bit. But then draw an arrow to the other column on the left and write down what that says about you that you're grateful for. And they need to be things that cannot be taken away from you, nothing external. So for example, I'm grateful for the promotion, draw an arrow. I love that I'm so ambitious. You know, you can be ambitious with or without a job. I'm so grateful for my partner. A partner can come or go. You put an arrow and write, I'm so grateful that I'm a kind and loving person and partner. That can be who you are with or without a partner. And so you link every single external to what that says about you and your soul that is not reliant on anyone or anything else. And a good way to measure it is when we die, that soul that's going to leave our body and go wherever you believe it goes, what is that soul made of and how can you love that that Mm. is not based on anything material or external? And that's a beautiful practice in building self-love. And then number three uh, would be radical authenticity because when we try and be anything or anyone other than who we are right now in this moment, it's an act of self-rejection and self-rejection is the opposite of self-love. 
radical, unconditional acceptance right now by expressing and accepting exactly who we are, warts and all, is the most radical act of self-love that you can possibly give yourself. So it's easy to love yourself when you've got a six-pack. What about when you've got cellulite? Mm. It's easy to love yourself when your relationship's on fire. What about in the middle of a fight that's bringing up all your stuff? That is radical authenticity and radical self-acceptance. And if you can I am enough for yourself, not just in the mirror, but in those moments and show up for yourself when you don't want to, it is the biggest act of self-love. You know, imagine if you had a little child and they were overweight and they said, I want to go to school and play. And you said, no, honey, you're not good enough. You can't do anything until you lose weight. That's not self-love. That's not loving that kid. And we all have that little boy or little girl within us. And when we act as if we're not enough until we're perfect, that's not loving to ourselves. So it's loving yourself where you're at right now while giving yourself permission to be the best that you can be over time as well. Oh, amazing. I love that. So I guess just going back to the gratitudes journal, so we, we have this practice of, of writing down our gratitudes, but we always do it like in an evening or just before we go to bed. And I, I think it's really great actually flipping that to the morning because mm. what we're doing essentially is looking back over the day and, and being thankful for what's happened over the day. But like you said, it is very much material kind of things mm. because you're, mm. you're kind of reviewing your day and going, all right, well, this good thing happened, this good thing happened, this good thing happened. Yeah. Whereas I think getting up in the morning, you've kind of got a clean slate and you're you're not looking at those things, you're kind of looking at yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose there is that review process because I, when I do this mm. practice or, or get my clients to, you, you are kind of reviewing the last 24 hours, but energetically and frequency wise, you have had that sleep, you've had that meditate. And so the stresses of the day haven't crept in. So there's a much higher vibration when you're writing that. And there's that saying, how you start is how you finish. So we have something called a reticular activating system. And it's something that our unconscious mind does, which basically means it's kind of like, when you're at the airport and you know you've got to catch a plane and let's say that plane is called plane number 1111 because 1111 is the soulmate number right I've got it tattooed <laughs> on my hand. so 1111 uh, is my plane number and isn't it amazing that you can be in the airport and shuffling through your bags and getting a latte and you know people watching and on your phone you could even be on your phone in a conversation and your plane could be leaving in two hours and when over the speaker it says plane 1111 is going to be um you know gathering together in the waiting area soon you suddenly come out of your trance and go and your ears prick up and you go that message was for me and the part of your mind that allowed you to do that was your reticular activating system because you plugged in there listen out for 1111 that's important and so it's really important if you do gratitude in the morning it's almost like plugging into your reticular activating system gratitude is what's important that's what I'm on the hunt for and so throughout your day you're actually going to be mm. more grateful which will bring more things into your life to be grateful for and I guess within the context of relationships gratitude goggles that we need to be wearing gratitude goggles at all times because it's so easy to be the critical feedback committee towards our partner or ourself and that's really going to lead to a lot of unhappiness, tension, walking on eggshells and feeling not good enough. Whereas if you can have your gratitude goggles on and ignore the stuff you don't want more of and actually give gratitude and reinforcement to mm. stuff that you want more of, you're going to realise that you start being the best version of yourself and dating the best version of your partner because you know, positive reinforcement works with puppies and it also works with our self I, I love that though, right? Yeah? Because it's really, it is, it's simple, isn't it? It's it, it, like if you're looking for opportunities, you'll find opportunities. If you're looking for problems, 100%. you'll find problems. If you're trying to spot yellow 100%. cars, you'll spot yellow cars. Absolutely, exactly. You know what car you want to buy because it's the only one you see on the road, right? Yeah, yeah, or that kind of thing where like, someone in your world falls pregnant and then all of a sudden it feels like everybody's pregnant. It's like, I, had, I, I wasn't noticing all these pregnant people and now they're 100%. everywhere. Nothing, of, yeah. nothing changed, just what you're observing. Absolutely. And I guarantee a huge number of your listeners will start saying 1111 everywhere now. <laughs> They'll look at the time and it'll be 1111. They'll look at the number plate and it'll be because we've actually put that into their consciousness. It was always there, but they're now noticing it. Yeah, interesting. So I guess what are some of the practical things that we can do to encourage continuous self-love? Not as a once-off activity, I guess, but as a way of living. So I really think that metaphor of speaking to yourself the way you would speak to a young child is a really great practice to have in terms of self-talk. So no one's going to get it perfect. You are going to have moments where you scold yourself, where you say things to yourself that you may not say to other people and in a tone of voice that you wouldn't either. 
And you would correct that the way you would with that little girl or that little boy. You know, if you had a little, a beautiful little kid or a little boy that was four years old, that trusted you, that was innocent, that was nothing but love and light, and it was your job to mentor them, and you know that you're not going to do that by, you know, um, negatively reinforcing them and being nasty and calling them names and being really hard on them and, you know, getting the whip out. That's That never works. And mm. we know that deep down, but we do it with ourselves constantly. Now, what would happen if you'd had a really bad day and you kind of got a bit unconscious and your old patterns took over and you said to that little kid, you know, no, you're not just going to have dinner right now. I couldn't be bothered cooking for you. Mm. What you would what you would do in that situation is you wouldn't just go, oh, well, I messed up, I'll keep talking to that kid like that. You would stop and you'd take a breath and you'd say, I'm sorry, sweetheart, what I meant just then. I've had a really stressed day. That was my stuff, not yours. What I meant by that is I'd prefer you to eat something healthy and, <laughs> you know. And so be kind. That with, be kind, but it's always okay to recalibrate and correct yourself. The only thing worse than yelling at yourself and being unself-loving is then layering that with all of the guilt, the shame, the perfection, the sh- I shouldn't have done that, I meant to be being positive because now you have a whole bunch of problems instead of the one. Mm. So I, I really think that that permission to not be perfect and permission to recalibrate and correct yourself, you know, a plane leaves Sydney and I've got a lot of plane metaphors today. So <laughs> I, must, I, must be travel travel. I must be missing travel. I must be missing travel and you know a plane between here and the UK is off course 99% of the time but it's constantly recalibrating and as human beings we need to be able to do that with our self-love and with our relationships so Mm. you know if you notice that you're looking in the mirror and you're going god I'm fat and ugly just stop and go I'm sorry beautiful what I meant by that is you are enough and you're on a journey and you're not perfect but that's perfect you've earned this Mm. weight you you love chocolate and red wine you shouldn't be any skinnier than you are right now it's all perfect (laughs) you know so just having that sense of humor and that kindness and compassion with yourself and allowing yourself to recalibrate without actually making yourself wrong for there is no messing up it's just all recalibrating Mm. I love this so we've talked a little bit about that self-love piece something that we've heard you talk a little bit about is the different types of relationships. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. There's three core patterns or dynamics that typically play out in a relationship and it's really important you understand what these are. They all come from love. They all come from wanting to give and receive love, but some of them are healthy and some of them are not. So it's very, very important to understand. So the three main ones, and I'll give you the two dysfunctional ones followed by the ideal one, (laughs) are codependence, independence and then interdependence and the the end goal is to become interdependent now let me talk about the first two first codependence is when you have two people and unfortunately hollywood movies and and disney movies haven't done much to um to help this situation but codependence is where it's like comments like you complete me you're my other half i would be lost without you um If you, you know, if anything were to happen to you, my life would be over. And all of that is very romantic in movies like Gone with the Wind, but it's highly dysfunctional because it, what it really is, is a deep sense of insecurity that underlies comments like that. Mm -hmm. Because who would want to be in a relationship where that person defines and completes you? Because Even if you are each other's forever people and you are like, you know, swans and you are going to mate for life, anything can happen. You could be hit by a bus or, you know, Mm. that's just the reality of life. And I'm sure that that first swan would not want that second swan to be absolutely distraught and non-existent if one of those, you know, horrible things that happen in life happened. And the reality is um, all of that romance is a lot less romantic when you actually look at that dynamic that is underneath it, which is, you know, essentially if anything goes wrong, half of my body falls off and no one would want to go through that. It sounds awful. And what it means is if an argument happens in a relationship like that, the underlying fear is, is you can't leave me because I'm not me without you. And so what could be just an everyday tiff that could be easily resolved or even bring the couple closer is a huge cause of panic, trauma, fear, drama, and suddenly you've got a relationship that's like you can't go anywhere without each other. A tiny fight becomes a huge relationship trauma and both people forget who they are without each other. And if anything happens, it's disastrous. And if nothing happens, there's a big looming insecurity that's an elephant in the room for that whole relationship. Now, the opposite of that is an independent relationship. Now, usually an independent relationship happens because 
both parties of that relationship are fearful of being a codependent relationship. So it's almost like the pendulum has swung to the too far the other way. Polarity, yeah. And life is about shades of grey. It's not about the black and white. And I'm not talking 50 shades of grey. I'm not that kind of coach. But um, it it is about the shades of grey. So it's really about, you know, and and the way that I do all coaching, and I am a mindset expert first and foremost before being a relationship expert. So I understand a lot about psychology. And, you know, someone that always says yes is out of balance. Someone that always says no is out of balance. What is imbalance is the ability to say yes or no. Someone that's really in their masculine energy, whether they're a boy or a girl, is really out of balance. And someone that's really in their feminine energy is really out of balance. Boy or girl is irrelevant. What's in balance is a real yin-yang of masculine and feminine energy and the wisdom and intuition to know which one to put forward. And so the same happens with this codependent, interdependent versus independent issue where I guess those out of balance polarities are the codependents, which is like smushed together and insecure. And independent is just as insecure, but the reaction is like, I'm going to be do me, you're going to do you. And it's essentially two singles being single and labeling it as a relationship Mm. because deep down they are so fearful of becoming codependent because they've probably either been there and done that and it ended in tears or they've seen that potentially in other relationships, possibly their own parents, and they've gone, I never want to be that. And so they've done the exact opposite. But the reality is that has just as much insecurity as the codependent because they're scared and they're coming from fear rather than love, fear of losing themselves, fear of becoming too attached, fear of becoming codependent. But there's still it's still riddled with fear. And relationships can either come from love or fear. And if you ask me, I think love should come from love rather than fear because fear is always going to be the flip side of the coin. But why not focus on the love or you're going to rob yourself of the whole point of the whole thing, you know? And um the final, the final one, which really is that grey area in the middle, which has a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, and lets go of a bucket load of fear, is actually interdependence. And I guess if you imagine that I've got my life, which is like me holding a torch in front of me, and that torch radiates out a spotlight in front of me. My partner next to me also is holding a torch, which represents their life, their goals, their identity, who they are, their friends, their family, where they've come from, where they're going, what's on their vision board, if they've got one, all of that kind of stuff. And I guess my partner also has that spotlight out in front of them. And if you can imagine two people walking the the journey of life side by side, and they're both holding out their own independent spotlights, there's going to be an area where those lights overlap. And so it's me, me, and we in the middle. But you can see by that metaphor, if something was to happen to that other person through random accident, health, falling out of love, breaking up, or the things that just happen in life, and Mm. and any adult over a certain age acknowledges that, um, there's this deep sense of, well, that's just life, and I know that I'm on my journey and that's okay. There'd be a little part of me, which is the we part of us, that would be missing and I would grieve that, but I would still be me. And in time, I would recover because there's a big part of me that stayed on my journey. And I've picked someone whose journey is so compatible with mine that that chunk of us that's we is very we and very magical. Mm. And the synergy between my me and your me, there's a lot of magical alignment. Does it all have to be the same? No, because that difference keeps it spicy. But if something happened, there's not that underlying insecurity. There's that no, I've set it up to succeed this way from a place of love and being realistic and being healthy rather than a place of fear. Yeah, amazing. So if someone was listening and they were identifying with some of the traits of either that codependent type relationship or a really independent relationship, are the steps to sort of course correct the same or are they different? I would say that they essentially are. It's about get your vision board out, put that vision board together, get your partner to do the same if they choose to and don't be attached if they don't. Look at that and ask what would the best version of me do? Where would I want to be in seven years? And then get to the job of doing it and design your 10 out of 10 day because time is your most important currency. It's not money. Uh, What you do with your time is what you do with your life, believe it or not. People, if I say to them, would you give away your life? Like just if you could put your hand on a silver platter and say, there we go, just put that in the bin, would you do it? And they say, no. Mm. And I'm like, well, tell me what you do in the 24-hour period known as a day. I watch Netflix. I do whatever my partner wants to do. I usually skip the gym and I'm like, cool, where do you want to be in seven years? I hope that it's fat, lazy and miserable because if it's not, (laughs) you're doing the wrong stuff because your day is going to lead to your week, your month, 
your year and ultimately your life. And so if you're not doing in a 24-hour period what the best version of you would do in seven years, then you're doing the wrong stuff. So you need to schedule that stuff. When do you want to go to the gym? When do you want Mm. friend time? When do you want me time? When's the meditation? Have you got a gratitude journal? And that's my life. I'm a coach. So that's the stuff that sets my soul on fire. Maybe your day looks totally different to mine. But you need to be putting investments into all the little buckets that are going to end to that vision board or that 10 out of 10, you know, seven or 10 year plan. And you need to commit to it like your life depends on it. And some of it, there'll be crossover and your partner might have gym time and so do you and you can be training buddies. But If they want to sleep in when you've scheduled with you to go to the gym, let them sleep in and have Sundays as sacred sleep in time together because that's one of your buckets to have an amazing relationship. But stick to your buckets Monday to Friday. And there's a saying, if you're not on your goal plan, you're on someone else's. So most people are either on the wrong goal plan or on someone else's. So get on the right plan and goal plan and make sure it's yours. And that's the answer to not being codependent, being on their goal plan or being independent, um, you know, which is probably, there's probably a lot of that happening. And I guess the, the advice for the independent person is to maybe collaborate with your partner, invite them to the gym with you or find out what their plan is and look for the areas of overlap and say, cool, I've got my vision board and you've got yours. But if we were to create one together, what's our vision for us? And I think that would probably balance it. But they're similar techniques, but just with a slight tweak. Yeah, yeah. cool. So I think you've touched on it a little bit already, but how do you think you can create a great interdependent relationship without, I guess, merging into codependence? Because you're obviously coming as individuals yeah. and starting kind of out in that fashion. So how do you avoid going too far, I guess, and merging everything? Sure. Well, I think, you know, the truth sets you free. And if you if you have that as the truth of your relationship to start with, how you start is how you finish, as I said earlier. So just having this education and being able to put a label to it and actually saying, hey, we, one of the values, you know, you start a business and it has a mission statement and values. Mm. You start a relationship and at the most it might have a prenup if you if you go that far. <laughs> but it's, you know, where, where, where's the inspirational stuff? Like what's the vision board for, for that company? And what's the mission statement? And what are our top? three values and I really think one of the top three values should be that this will always remain an interdependent relationship which means we've come together because we do have enough in common for it to work Mm -hmm. and there's enough differences to keep it spicy and what's on your vision board what's on mine and what would be on ours and actually make the vision board and actually go what are our top three values that we stand for what are our top three non-negotiables what are our KPIs like no matter what no matter good no matter good, bad or ugly, our non-negotiables are we're doing a midweek and a weekend date night every single week for the rest of our life and there are no exceptions and nothing is more important than that. That's one of our KPIs or maybe it's once a week. Um, Another KPI is that we're interdependent, which means our goal should never be how to compromise so that we can have the same vision board. Our goal should always be how do I help you fulfil what's on yours? How do you help me fulfil what's on mine? And how do we fully commit to what's on ours? And our individual ones are allowed to be different as long as they don't breach, you know, values like monogamy. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I love so much of what you've just shared. I'm, I'm really curious. So if we've done the, the work individually to get to a place um, where we are in a, a, you know, a healthy, happy, thriving, interdependent mm-hmm. relationship, what are some of the things that we can do to keep it that way? Absolutely. Well, I do actually think date night is really important. That's a bit of a a classic. But honestly, I coach so many couples and I get to coach the ones that work and I get to coach the ones that don't work. And in my own personal life, I've been in the ones that work and I've been in the ones that don't work. So I've got personal seal of approval on this. And communication is key. I remember when I was, you know, a bit young and a bit less less experienced, adults much wiser than me at the time would say, pick someone you can communicate with. And I'd think, how boring. I want someone someone that I feel magical with. I want someone with love at first sight. I want someone that we have fun together. And that stuff's great. But, you know, if you're going to be with someone for the long haul, and I'm talking decades, Mm. then you are going to go through the good, the bad and the ugly. It's easy to be in love with someone when you're in the honeymoon period. It's amazing how communication just is on point in the honeymoon period because it is. Hormones make sure of it. (laughs) Hormones like dopamine make all communication seem like good communication. And it's kind of like, you know, you say to your partner, can you you help me take out the bins? And you kind of skip to help put them out the bins. But, you know, 10 years in when you say it in that tone on, you know, every morning, it's like, stop nagging me. Guess what? It's the same partner saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And communication is key because 
because you're going to be repetitive. You're going to nag. You're going to go through deaths. You're going to be fired from jobs. There's going to be traumas. And I'm sorry to be the world's best motivational speaker right now, but (laughs) spoiler alert, life is going to get in the way. There's going to be lack of libido. There may be kids. There's going to be. And when you go through that stuff, that dopamine and that serotonin ain't there anymore. That honeymoon period, I believe in a constant honeymoon period, but you've got to build that stuff once the hormones wear off. And communication is key because intimacy is the thing that separates your friend from being a friend. And if you start losing intimacy, you start having a flatmate and a friend. And, man, you can't have enough friends, but it's kind of awkward when that's meant to be the love of your life. So the difference that makes the difference is intimacy, and intimacy is not sex. Sex is a byproduct of intimacy. The word intimacy conveniently sounds like this, into me see. <laughs> now, the only way that you're going to allow your partner to into me see is by being real, raw, and vulnerable, and how you do that is communication. So you don't wait until things get so big that you're screaming and you're snapping at them, take the rubbish out in a horrible tone. You express yourself the moment that a thing becomes a thing no matter if it's Mm. this big or big and I know people say don't sweat the small stuff and be grateful and I really do believe in that and there should be so many deposits in the gratitude account because you're you know oh honey I love the way you just cleaned the house for me today sweetheart the way you remembered my anniversary made me feel so special darling you know how you just wrote me that romantic text out of the blue it honestly gave me goosebumps and you've filled up the gratitude tank so much that it's overflowing and guess what that means you have permission to go back to the person and say honey I know we've been together for a while and I don't want you ever not to be real with me but you know when you brought up your ex-girlfriend I don't know why but it just really triggered something in me and I felt a bit sensitive you know what when you can be that vulnerable and you don't need to leave it to the point that you're being insecure or psycho or jealous or controlling, you just be vulnerable and you just let it pop out just like a little delicate secret and just release it into the universe. And do you know what your partner will probably do? Go, did you get jealous? I love that. You're normally so independent. Come here. Yeah. You know, and it'll actually bond you. So I actually just think permission to be radically real but that is pre-framed by saying you put millions of dollars in the gratitude fund before you need to make those little um, withdrawals, withdrawals yeah. of, of realness and rawness. And it, I think that combination is a winning combination to just keep that romance, that connection, that interdependence and just that honeymoon alive forever. And if you can do this, the honeymoon at decade three can actually be better than week three because it's not you falling in love but it's you stepping into love with someone whose soul you see because all the walls are down and you're both so safe to be real Mm, and choosing to continue to step into it like day after day 100% 100% I don't I don't love falling in love I like stepping into love and you know anyone can get married but would you renew your vows that's what I'm interested in yeah I love that hey so this has been amazing we've talked you know about dating forever and loving life and being really intentional. My favorite. <laughs> yeah, re- being really intentional about it. But one of the core values that we have at Fuel Collective is to be the change. And that's really about being the change in your own life and taking accountability for what you have the ability to influence, but also to be the change that you want to see in the world. So to say thank you for joining us today, we've given seven days of training sessions to young parents um, to help impart some knowledge around child nutrition and immunization and contraception and family planning. Um, So this project is looked after by Academy of Root Development in India, and we've made that possible by our partnership with Buy One, Give One. So thank you so much for making that possible. I'm honoured. What a great cause. Thank you so much. Not a problem. So if people have really enjoyed what you've been talking about today and want to learn a bit more or want to connect with you, how should they do that? Look, I um I had a little think about it and I would love to give a bit of a special gift. I do unfortunately have to keep it limited in numbers because I am a busy little soulmate coach. So I've got 10 spots available and um, and once those fill up, I'd still be happy to have a quick chat. So don't hold back if it does resonate, but I'd love to give away 10 soulmate sessions and that can be used either as an individual or as a couple and that's an hour with me. So I'll give you my email. So it's Miranda at MirandaClaireInternational.com. Perfect. And we'll pop it in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Miranda. This has been amazing. And I think whoever gets to snap up those sessions is very lucky indeed. Thank you so much, guys. It's been wonderful. Thanks heaps for joining us. If you love what we're doing here and want more, subscribe to the Date Forever podcast to make sure you never miss an app. 
Come and hang out with us and other awesome couples who are fueling up their relationships in the Thriving Couples Collective Facebook group or check us out at purecollective.com.au. Until next time, keep on dating because better relationships equal a better world.